Hello and welcome to day two of the forum. Thanks a lot for joining us here in Sintra and online. Yesterday, we looked at the latest thinking on inflation from aspects ranging from supply shocks to who pays for price pressures. This morning, we want to delve into other aspects of the consequences of strong price pressures. Our first session today will look at how central banks should proceed with their efforts to raise rates and shrink their balance sheets. We'll pose the question of what the ideal size of the balance sheet should be and what sort of securities it should be made up of. The second session, meanwhile, looks at how fiscal policy and monetary policy can work in tandem to lessen the chances of price pressures becoming entrenched. I'd like to now turn to the chair of both sessions, ECB Vice President, Luis de Guindos. Mr. de Guindos, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Claire, for this introduction that I think that you have put uh, very clearly uh, the objectives of these uh, two sessions that uh, directly and indirectly are related. We are going to talk about monetary policy. The first session will be about normalization of monetary policy with uh, a focus on the size uh, of uh, the balance sheet of the central banks. And the second one about uh, the policy mix, the, the, the interconnection and the relationship between monetary and fiscal policy. So without any uh, further delay, let me introduce our speakers for today, Annette uh, Wiesen Jorgensen. Annette is a senior advisor at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Welcome. And uh, you, will, you will present your paper on the normalization. And afterwards, we will have Jordi Galli. Jordi Galli is a senior researcher at the Center for Research in International Economics, a professor at the University Pompeu Fabra, and a research professor at the Barcelona School of Economics. So you know p perfectly you know, the flow of events. So you will have uh, you know, the, the, the floor for 25 minutes to present your paper. And afterwards, uh, Jordi will make some comments and he will have uh, uh, 15, 15 minutes. And afterwards, we will open the floor for questions. So just in case that we have any questions from, you know, uh, from uh, WebEx, uh, please, uh, you can raise your virtual hand and we will try to collect all the questions that you are going to ask. So without any further delay, Annette, you have the floor. Hmm? Thanks very much. So I would like to talk about central bank balance sheet policy when the short interest rate is above the effective lower bound. And as I'm now working for the Federal Reserve, I'm gonna be a little bit more diplomatic than I normally am and just highlight in large red funds, that these are just my views and not those of the Fed, so please don't give Chair Powell a hard time about this later on in the panel. All right, so the question is, what should central banks do with their balance sheets when they're not really needed in the sense that above the effective lower bound, the central bank can adjust the monetary policy stance by adjusting up and down the interest rate on reserves. So I'm gonna argue that convenience shields are gonna be very useful for thinking about central bank balance sheet size and asset mix. By convenience shield, I just mean benefits on investments that you get as an investor above and beyond the principal and interest rate payments. They can come from liquidity in the form of state transaction costs, or they could come from safety in the sense that if you hold the security at very low default risk, you don't have to expend resources on credit risk analysis. Now, central bank reserves are perhaps the ultimate safe and liquid asset, and so I'm gonna argue that providing these reserves adds value to the economy in a similar way that the supply and cash does. So, the main result of the paper is that I'm gonna derive, theoretically and empirically, what I'll call convenience maximizing reserve supplies. I'm gonna distinguish two cases that depend on how the central bank supplies those reserves. In case A, the central bank is able to supply reserves without holding assets that themselves have convenience yields. As a result, the, uh, the convenience maximizing reserve supply will be larger in a sense that'll become precise as we go along. I'll contrast that with case B, in which reserves are supplied by the central bank holding assets that have convenience yields, and therefore, the convenience maximizing reserve supply will be smaller 
with the main intuition being that when the central bank is in case B, it's supplying liquidity through reserves, but it's quote unquote eating liquidity by holding treasuries or bonds, for example. So I'm gonna lay out the argument into five steps. First, I'm gonna argue that which kind of assets the central bank is able to hold is to a large extent driven by political constraints. I'll contrast the Fed and the ECB. Then, just for those of you who don't think about this stuff every day, I wanna just remind you of the sense in which the central bank doesn't really need a particular balance sheet size to hit its target policy stance above the effective lower bound. And therefore, it's gonna be relevant to discuss what are some factors that could guide that choice of balance sheet size uh, when, it's not, when a particular size is not strictly needed. Then we'll dig into the main framework of deriving the convenience maximizing reserve supply as a function of the central banks as a choice. And then I'm gonna estimate this out for the US and the Euro area uh, in the last bit. Okay, so let's think about the politics of this. So the Federal Reserve, as you know, has announced plans that it will hold mainly treasuries in the longer run quote, thereby minimizing the effect of Federal Reserve holdings on the allocation of credit across sectors of the economy. Now this choice really fundamentally goes back to the Federal Reserve Act under which the Fed can hold uh, securities that are guaranteed by, that are issued by or guaranteed by the US government. Now of course, the Fed has had very successful uh, programs for corporate bond purchases during COVID, but those were uh, constructed under emergency uh, lending conditions. And similarly, the discount window is generally priced to be used mostly in crisis. So I wanna give you a quote here by Broaddus and Goodfriend who expressed well the common sentiment in the US that the Fed really should mainly hold treasuries. So I quote, the Fed's asset acquisition policy ought to give priority to preserving public support for the Fed's independence by insulating the central bank as much as possible from potentially damaging dispute, disputes regarding credit allocation. When the Fed purchases Treasury securities, it leaves all the fiscal decisions to Congress and the Treasury. So that's the Fed. By contrast, I think the ECB could likely hold only assets without convenience yields in the longer run. Remember the ECB has historically supplied reserves through collateralized lending to banks. Uh, in fact, in the Euro area, it's the government bond purchases that have been more politically sensitive. As you know, they have been challenged in court. Um, Isabel Schnabel, actually in a very nice recent speech, states well the sentiment amongst many in the Euro area that there are additional considerations relevant for the assessment of whether a large bond portfolio is desirable or not. One is that the lack of a consolidated public sector balance sheet raises more fundamental concerns about monetary fiscal interactions in a currency union with sovereign member states. These concerns may potentially undermine the credibility and independence of the central bank. So in other words, Across the Atlantic, what's politically sensitive for a central bank to hold differs, with government bonds being the politically safe choice in the US and a politically riskier choice in the Euro area. That means that from the perspective of supplying convenient assets, the ECB is at an advantage because it fits case A better where it supplies reserves without at the same time subtracting uh, bonds, say, um, with convenience yields, or it could decide to do so. The Fed is at a disadvantage because when it supplies reserves, it is at the same time withdrawing a treasury supply from the private sector to hold. All right, so moving on to the second step. In what sense is a particular balance sheet size not needed when the short rate is above the effective lower bound? I'm gonna review this well-known point within the framework of a recent paper of mine because we're gonna use that framework later on in any case. The framework, uh, models the banking sector's demand for reserves, and there's three simple ingredients. The first one is that reserves pay interest. The second one is that reserves have liquidity benefits for banks in the sense that banks that have reserves can manage deposit in and outflows without having to sell illiquid assets such as loans or securities at high transaction costs. The third factor is that there's a balance sheet cost for banks. From the, banking, uh, from the bank's perspective, this captures capital requirements such as the supplementary leverage ratio. Now, in terms of that second fact, the, li the liquidity benefits, we capture that through what we call a convenience value function V, which just simply measures the expected transaction cost savings to the banks from managing uh, deposit in and outflows with reserves rather than illiquid assets. A crucial element in the analysis is gonna be the derivative of this V function with respect to reserves. So I'm gonna call it V, I'm gonna call it v prime R 
It's the convenience shield from reserves. It's the marginal value of an extra dollar of reserves. And that marginal value is going to be decreasing in reserves as additional reserves are less and less useful, but it's going to be increasing in deposits since having more reserves is more valuable if there's more deposits to be managed. Reserve demand then is simply the bank's first order condition for borrowing at the market interest rate R, think here the Fed funds rate or the European short term rate, uh, for borrowing at that interest rate R and investing in reserves, where on the right hand side you have the net benefits of reserves, so what the bank gets out of borrowing to invest in reserves. And that net benefit comes from the interest rate on reserves, the convenience yield on reserves, V prime R, and then subtracting out the bank's balance sheet cost. If we graph this out, focusing on the left graph for the reserves market, um, the demand curve is in blue. I'm going to have two of them. I'll go through that in a second. Uh, the demand curve in blue is just the formula that we just derived. It's going to shift up with interest rate and reserves. Naturally, as reserves are more, are more attractive if they have a high interest rate, it'll shift down with the balance sheet cost. And the whole shape is just driven by this convenience yield function V prime R, which eventually goes to zero. So that it's going to completely flatten out way out to the right. OK, so consider the two points A and B. At both of these points, the central bank hits its target interest rate R, the, the target R. Uh, at point A, the central bank has chosen to have a low interest rate on reserves. Accordingly, the reserve demand is low. And in order to hit the target, the central bank needs positive scarcity of reserves, which it achieves by choosing a low supply. In contrast, at point B, the central bank has chosen a high interest rate on reserves. Accordingly, the demand curve is high. And to hit the target, the central bank now needs negative scarcity on reserves. And that's achieved by a high supply. So in other words, there's actually many different combinations of the interest rate on reserves and the quantity of reserves that'll enable a given policy stance. I summarized that in the right picture, which I have labeled the ISO market rate curve. Um, along that curve, the short market rate hits the target. Now, you can think of it as basically how to set the balance sheet size given the interest rate on reserve, or conversely, how to set the interest rate on reserve given the balance sheet. Actually, as a policymaker, what you really want is the ISO market rate for the long interest rate, because the long interest rate is a better measure of the overall policy stance. Um, it's that ISO market rate curve, it's in the paper. It's a bit steeper than the current one, because at lower balance sheet size, term premium are going to be higher. But the basic point remains is that there's a whole schedule of choices for the, of the, for the central bank when the short rate is not constrained by the, by the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound. So therefore, let's talk through some factors that might be relevant for setting balance sheet policy above the effective low amount. I'm going to focus on the first one, the central bank's supply of liquid and safe assets. A second commonly mentioned factor is side effects of large balance sheets. Those stem from the fact that the banks have to fund the reserves, which essentially can happen in one of two ways. Either reserves have to crowd out the bank's other assets, that could lead to associated welfare losses from less lending to firms and so forth. Or reserves have to crowd in the size of the banking sector such that its overall liabilities grow. That, of course, could be good if those liabilities have liquidity and safety benefits to their holders, but it also could be bad from a financial per stability perspective, especially if those uh, extra liabilities are uninsured deposits, for example. A third commonly mentioned factor here is interest rate volatility. As I graphed out before, the reserve demand curve tends to be flatter for high quantity, which means that if, uh, in practice, the autonomous factors of the central bank are very volatile, that leads to volatility in reserve supply. And that, in turn, leads to less interest rate volatility if you are out on that right tail of the reserve demand curve. Finally, central bank profits, of course, are an issue. Um, and in that sense, a large current balance sheet may be viewed as limiting headroom for future QE, as recently emphasized in a speech by Hauser. So I'm going to focus on the first one, but let me just suggest that you guys, as policymakers, um, start from my numbers and then add and subtract based on your personal preferences regarding the importance of the other factors. All right, so let's then dig in to the convenience uh, maximizing reserve supply. And, uh, and derives, uh, I just need a couple of formulas and then we can get to the data. Okay, so think about the Friedman rule for the optimal supply of money. 
it says that to maximize the welfare for money, the central banks should keep supplying them until that last supplied unit has no value for managing payments. Translated to reserves, this would suggest setting the convenience yield on reserves, net of these balance sheet costs to zero. Accordingly, this is a reserve number that central banks calculate. It has many different names across different central banks. That is, of course, very useful, but what if the central bank's assets also have convenience yield? So to think about that, let's talk now about not just convenience yield on reserves, but convenience yield on bonds. And for the sake of concreteness, let me illustrate this for treasuries, but of course it would work the same for bonds. I'm graphing here yields against default probability. The straight line illustrates the normal upward sloping relation. And this idea of convenience yield on bonds is just a statement that bonds such as treasuries that have extremely low default risk tends to plot below the line, as you can, you can see with that bottom red dot where the treasury bonds are plotted far below the line. So that means that if we think about the yield spread between treasuries and uh, corporate bonds uh, that don't appeal to these safety and liquidity investors, then that yield spread is not only going to have the usual default component, it's also going to have a component from the treasury convenience yield. Essentially, the spread's going to widen out because the treasury yields are artificially low because some investors are willing to hold them due to their safety and liquidity properties. One can implement that decomposition in practice by observing that the treasury convenience yields should become really small for sufficiently large treasury supply as this demand is saturated. Implement that, implementing that decomposition in work with Krishnamurti, we estimate in earlier work a very large convenience yield, convenient yield on treasuries. It's a bit lower when you benchmark relative to AAA bonds, uh, which might suggest that they themselves have some appeal to these safety and liquidity investors. I'm going to use this spread to measure treasury convenience yield going forward to just keep in mind that if anything, my uh, results will understate just how special the treasuries are. All right, so now we're ready to derive the main result and focusing on a central bank that's in case B, uh, where it supplies reserve through holdings of bonds with convenience yields, uh, we need the following two formulas. The first one is just the central bank's balance sheet. On the left-hand side, it's the central bank's holdings of convenient bonds. On the right-hand side, the central bank's liabilities, which is the reserves plus the autonomous factor. The second equation we need is the private sector's convenience from holding reserves, that's the red term, and convenient bonds, that's the blue term. And notice, importantly, inside the blue term, that the, central, the private sector's holding, holdings of convenient bonds is the total supply B minus the central bank holdings, uh, BCB. All right, so now the main theoretical result of the paper is the following, contrasting case A and B. If a central bank is, case, is in case A and is able to supply reserves without holding assets that have convenience yields, then it should just focusing, focus on convenience from reserves. That's maximized by setting the net convenience yield on reserves to zero, as we have discussed. Uh, by contrast, in case B, if the central bank has to supply the reserves by buying uh, bonds with convenience yields, then it needs to focus on both parts of the formula, the reserves and the bonds, and that overall convenience is maximized by equalizing the convenience yields on reserves and bonds. I show in the paper, just as a footnote, that this result holds regardless of exactly how the banking sector funds the reserves through this crowding and the crowding out mechanism that I mentioned before. Right, so here's the fun part. Let's graph this out. So let me start with case A. So the, left, the graph to the left illustrates the reserve market. We have already talked through the reserve demand curve. Uh, the total convenience value from reserves is the area between the demand curve and the interest rate on reserves. You can split it up into the consumer surplus and the producer surplus, as indicated. They sum up to the net convenience yield on reserves. Okay, so. You can see that the supply in the picture here in case A is not optimal from a convenience maximization perspective because you could increase the sum of the consumers and producers surplus by supplying more. So illustrating that here with the green line, this illustrates case A where the central bank supplies reserves to the point that there's no reserve scarcity. By contrast, in case B, we need not only that graph from the reserves market, we need also a graph from the bond market. That's the graph to the right, 
where in blue I'm graphing the downward sloping private sector convenience shield from treasuries. Now, uh, I talked through point A in the left graph uh, for case A. Let's, let's discuss whether that's optimal now in case B where the central bank has to supply reserves by buying bonds. You, I have, uh, for that purpose, plotted in where would that point A be in the bond picture, and it's really high. So that's because at point A, the central bank holds, supplies a lot of reserves. It does so by buying bonds for concreteness, let's focus on the Fed and say they're buying treasuries. And because the central bank buys a lot of treasuries, there's not a lot of treasuries to be held by the private sector. Accordingly, the treasuries are really scarce. All right, so what is the central bank to do in this case? Basically, you should grab those two green supply curves and just pull them out. Okay, so I was trying to come up with some snazzy term for this. You could think of it as sort of open the curtain Okay, just go to your hotel room, grab those two sticks that hang on the curtains and just pull them to the right. If you remember that, then you have remembered the main point of the paper. So at then the red uh, supply curves, overall convenience value is maximized by equalizing that on reserves and treasury. Okay, I wanna just make a comment about the ECB. Uh, since I have contrasted these two stark cases, case A and case B, of course, there could be intermediate cases. So for example, suppose that the ECB, for reasons outside my framework, decided to supply reserves with a mix of bank lending and government bond holdings, some of which were convenient. Then it's straightforward to show that convenience is maximizing by, maximized by setting the net convenience yield equal to the average convenience yield on the ECB's holdings. So for example, suppose, with an apology to the Dutch, that the, only the German bonds have convenience yields. Uh, the right-hand side here would be the convenience yield on bonds times the portfolio weight on bonds, which would be the product of omega, the ECB's portfolio weight on bonds, and alpha, one, the weight of bonds in the ECB's bond portfolio. All right, so now we're ready for the data. Uh, let's, let's start with the US. So uh, what we need out of the data is Empirically, we need to figure out how to measure the convenience shields. And then we need to estimate those two convenience shield functions, the V prime R and the V prime T, so we can start setting stuff to zero or equal to each other. So starting with the market for reserves in the US, I'm gonna use the Fed funds rate as a proxy for R, the market rate, and therefore I'm gonna use the Fed funds IOR spread as my empirical measure of the net convenience shield and reserves. It's currently really low at negative seven basis points. To estimate the whole reserve demand function, I'm gonna follow a, that earlier paper of mine with Lopez Alito and assume that the net convenience yield function is log linear in its inputs. That gives us the estimating equation in red. Now, I need to talk you through why I have to instrument for excess reserves, and that's because they're correlated with the error term. Uh, that also gives me an occasion to illustrate the role of the ONRP facility as well as the ceiling facility uh, the discount we know here for the Fed, um, for this whole reserve demand framework. If you look at the graph here to the bottom right, we have our reserve demand curve as before, but now that we have this floor and ceiling facility, they basically cut off the tails of the reserve demand. So uh, focusing on the role of the ONRP facility, any supply of liquidity from the Fed past the red vertical line is gonna go into the ONRP facility, thereby preventing the market interest rate from falling below the floor. Now that means also, though, that if there's a reserve demand shock shifting the blue line up and down, even if the Fed doesn't react and keeps the total supply of reserve plus ONRP constant, you're gonna get a change in the mix of those two, which is gonna imply that you can't run over less in the regression. So I'm gonna instrument reserves with reserve plus ONRP. It turns out not to matter much if you implement, sorry, if you instrument for deposits, but it is crucial to control for deposits. All right, so here's the, Estimation then for the US, um, the estimating, estimated equation is at the top. And to emphasize the role of deposits, contrast the two graphs uh, at the bottom here. To the left is just the data. It's a Fed funds IOR spread graphed against reserves plus ONRP supply. You can see it's trying to look like a downward sloping demand curve for reserve, but it's almost like something is pulling on it, pulling it up over time, and that's a growth in deposits. Uh, by contrast, 
in the right picture is the result of the estimation. I'm changing the x-axis there. You'll see that it's a function of both supply as well as deposits. Uh, it com that comes from rewriting the estimation equation as stated in blue at the top to define deposit-adjusted reserve plus ONRP supply, which is supply adjusted for the need for supply. You can see you get a beautiful looking demand curve in the bottom right in that case. All right, turning to treasuries, I'm gonna use the AAA treasury spread as my starting point for estimating treasury convenience yields. It's despite the fact that there's so much treasury supply currently, uh, that spread is still large. In a second, I'm gonna estimate a default component of about 31 basis points, meaning that the convenience yield on treasuries currently is, despite the high supply, still 35 basis points. This is when you're supposed to have an aha moment and say, wait, it was minus seven basis points before for reserves and now here it's 35 basis points for treasuries. There's something wrong that is kind of the point. Okay, so I'm gonna use the AAA treasury spread as a general, which is a long maturity spread. I'm gonna use that as my general measure of the convenience yield on treasuries because there's not a whole lot of term structure, at least down to the three year point where in the paper I have data to show that. All right, now again, we need not just a number, we need a whole function. So to estimate the treasury convenience yield function, I'm gonna follow a different paper of mine uh, where the top left graph is the main picture from that paper with Krista Murthy. It graphs the AAA treasury spread against treasury supply. Thus tracing out the V prime T, the convenience yield on treasuries. Now in the top right, if you add in the, the post GFC points, you can see they look like outliers. <coughs> and that basically suggests that this whole convenience stuff has become even more important after the GFC that the demand curve has shifted to the right. That's because of Fed and foreign demand shocks. I'm showing you that in the bottom picture is where on the left, I'm subtracting Fed holdings from supply. You see the outlier points are migrating a little bit to the left. And then in the bottom right, I'm subtracting out both Fed and foreign holdings. You can see then you get back to a more normal looking demand curve. Now, from the perspective of our estimation, what we need is the bottom left picture. We need the one that focuses on the private sector's overall holdings of treasuries. So assuming again a log linear functional form and including year dummies post GFC to fit those outliers and an asymptote C to account for the default risk, we estimate, I estimate this in annual data. And that means we are ready for the final numbers uh, for the U.S., I'm going to show you both case A and case B, but keep in mind case B is the empirically most relevant one. Here in, the ca in case A, given today's deposits of around 17 trillion, I estimate that a uh, reserve plus ONRP supply of about 3.3 trillion would set the convenience yield on reserves net of the balance sheet cost to zero. That's, of course, much smaller than the current value, about 5.5 trillion. Importantly, that number grows over time. Okay, remember, deposits grow over time, deposits matter. So in red, I'm illustrating the evolution of this uh, line over time, and the blue line is the actual for comparison. The green line to the right illustrates the growth in deposits. All right, turning to the more important case B, we are back to this open the window, open the curtains thing, uh, where we equalize the convenience yield. So here I am graphing in red, V prime R, the convenience yield on reserves. It looks small because I had put it into the same picture as V prime T, the one for treasuries, uh, which is much higher. So this is just a simple way of saying there's a lot more demand for the convenience of treasuries than there is for the convenience of reserves because treasuries can be held by others than the, than the banking sector. Okay, so currently if the Fed were to only hold treasuries as assets, we would be at the A point. From a convenience maximization perspective, we should move to the B point where the convenience yields are equalized. That happens at a convenience yield of about 29 basis points for a supply of about 600 billion. All right, again, that e evolves over time because deposits changes, but also treasury supply changes. So I'm gonna skip the math on that. Okay, finally, let me just take a second to uh, do case A for the euro area. So there I'm gonna measure the net convenience yield on reserve by the spread between the European short term rate and the deposit facility rate, I've used Eonia minus eight and a half basis points in the period before the ESTR is available. Uh, there's a spike in the series around the European sovereign debt crisis, likely to do bank default risk. So to not have to model that, I'm gonna start the estimation here in 2013. Assuming again, a log linear functional form. And in this case, 
not having to instrument since DCB doesn't have an ONIP facility, um, we get the following result. Focus on the white picture, which is the reserve demand fit for the euro area. You can see the fit is quite good. I do want to flag that the blue line, the fitted line, is a little to the right of the data, right around zero, so my numbers for the ECB context might be a little too high for the convenience maximizing supplies. One could work a little bit more on the functional form to get a slightly better fit. In the euro area, it turns out that from an R squared perspective, it actually doesn't matter much to control for deposits because they're highly correlated with liquidity. But of course, it does matter in the sense that if you ignore deposits, you would incorrectly think that the convenience maximizing supply was constant over time, which it's not. Let me also just flag that the Bank of England has a great blog post uh, showing the role of deposits for reserve demand in the UK context and how that changes things over time. Okay, so then the number for the case A for the euro area I got is a liquidity supply of about 1.4 trillion. And again, I'm flagging that this is probably a little too high because of that functional form issue. Now, if I can take this couple of couple of seconds, uh, Philip Hartman emailed me saying, look, I know that for the euro area you're pushing case A, but what would happen in case B? I haven't done a full estimation of this because it's difficult to estimate the V prime T function for bonds because it may have changed with the introduction of the euro and so forth. But if you, if, you know, the basic point uh, should hold that there is a large convenient yield on bonds. So this, it really does matter if the ECB can go with case A. Using the KFV bond spreads as proxies for the one convenience yield, you know, you get pretty large numbers. So if you remember the formula that I had before for the euro case, suppose we set the, bo the bond convenience yield to 40 basis points. And let's say the ECB only supplied reserves through bond holdings, and they did so in proportion to the capital key, which is about 20% for Germany. Then the right-hand side is eight basis points, which would imply liquidity of about 500 billion. Now that's too low because as the ECB held fewer and fewer bonds, the bond convenience yield would shrink, so the right-hand side would be smaller than eight basis points, but this is just to give you uh, sort of the basic point that it really does matter whether the ECB chooses to be in case A or case B. So to conclude, I have laid out a framework for thinking about balance sheet policy uh, when the short rate is above the effective lower bound. I have pushed for a central role for convenience yields and argue that the convenience maximizing reserve supply depends crucially on the central bank's asset choice, which in turn is determined by political constraints. I have contrasted case A and case B and argued that the ECB could likely choose to return to case A, whereas the Fed is, has announced that it will be in case B. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette. Uh, well, I think that you have exceeded uh, your convenient uh, limit time by four minutes, but uh, you know, it's acceptable. It's acceptable. It's in the range, in the range. Okay, now, Jordi, <laughs> it's your turn. Okay, good morning. Uh, let me start by thanking the ECB for in inviting me to this uh, great event and also for asking me to discuss uh, this paper, which I have enjoyed very much and I have learned uh, much from. So in my discussion, uh, I will do two things. I will summarize uh, Annette's framework, and then I will discuss some of what I think are the implications for ECB policy. Now first, in terms of motivation, I think the motivation for this paper is straightforward. Uh, as part of the normalization of monetary policy, most central banks have started to, to shrink their balance sheets or are planning uh, to do so uh, soon. Uh, so this is the shift from QE uh, to QT. And then uh, in that context, there's a very natural question that arises, which is uh, how much QT? Where, you know, when, shall, when should central banks stop? Equivalently, we could rephrase this uh, question by um, asking what is the optimal supply of reserves given uh, autonomous factors? And uh, this is the question that Annette is uh, seeking to, to answer in this paper, and she adopts a particular uh, perspective to answer that question, which is the one on um, optimal supply of uh, uh, what uh, she calls convenient assets, that is assets that are highly liquid and, and, high, and extremely safe. So uh, my assessment of the paper is that, well, this is a very, uh, it's a very nice paper. It brings together some of uh, Annette's uh, uh, previous research. It's extremely timely and highly policy relevant, so it's the perfect paper I would say for, for, for this event. So 
what are the key ingredients of uh, an ETS framework? First is the notion of um, uh, the convenience value of some assets. That is, <clears throat> some value that investors attach to those assets beyond the pecuniary payoffs that those assets have. So this may be related to extreme safety or the high, very high uh, liquidity of those assets. Reserves are certainly a, um, a convenient asset from the point of view of banks. And uh, we can uh, express the value that banks get from the reserves at the, at the central bank uh, uh, with this convenience value function, uh, V of R. Now, there's also a holding cost uh, for these reserves, uh, the reserves which has to do with the, the capital requirements of holding uh, such reserves, and she denotes that by fee. So, uh, given this function, we can derive a, a demand for, for reserves which, uh, no, I'm going to use a, a diagram that I find somewhat more useful than the one that an, um, Annette has used uh, and uh, to, to make the basic argument. So here we have on the vertical axis the uh, spread between the money market rate and the interest rate on reserves. And uh, on the horizontal axis, the quantity of reserves. So the, 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 the red line is the, the demand for reserves uh, from banks. So essentially, um, um, given the, the, the spread on reserves, uh, the banks will hold reserves up to the point where the, the marginal convenience uh, uh, value of, of those reserves, net of the holding cost, equals uh, that spread. That is exactly compensates for the fact that a money market rate is maybe higher than the interest rate on reserves. So that's the, the red line. And as you can see, it asymptotes uh, horizontally to minus fee, the, the, the holding uh, cost per unit of reserves. So that's a way to, to, to reconcile the, this theoretical framework uh, with the fact that on many occasions, we observe that the um, money market rate is below the interest rate on reserves, okay? Now, the central bank will supply reserves, that's the vertical, um, the vertical blue line, and that determines, uh, that determines the spread, okay? Uh, now, as Annette has mentioned, there is an important uh, uh, separation result that makes this analysis uh, meaningful. And just looking at the equation above, that is the, 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 the equation that describes the demand for reserves, uh, you, you can see it immediately. In the, in, in, in the old days, some central banks were, uh, had um, a, a zero interest rate on reserves, okay? So IOR was zero. In that case, there was a one-to-one -one mapping between the money market rate, which is the, presumably the interest rate that the central bank wanted to target, and the amount of reserves, okay? So there was, once the central bank decided on the monetary policy stance, that is on R, there was just one value of reserves that would implement that R. Now, with, interest, with, a with um, interest rate on reserves, that changes because any given monetary policy stance, any R, is consistent with a continuum of values, of configurations, if you want, of values of the interest rate on reserves and the quantity of reserves. So that makes the, the, the reserve policy problem meaningful. What is the quantity of reserves that the central bank uh, uh, should hold? And that will determine the interest rate on reserves given the, po the policy stance, okay? So, and that's the, the problem that Annette attacks in, 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 in her paper. And she considers two cases. The first case is the one in which reserves are adjusted through purchases or sales of what she calls inconvenient assets. So, for instance, uh, loans to banks, as it was the case uh, in, the East, um, in the Euro area before 2015. So, in that case, the optimal policy, and again, let me use the graph to, to point to that, uh, uh, no, to represent that optimal policy, goes as follows, the, the central bank should provide reserves up to the point where the, uh, the marginal convenience value of reserves, net of holding cost, uh, equals zero. That is, you know, it, it, from the point of view of the central bank, supplying reserve uh, is, is costless, and from the point of view of society, in a sense, so it should, it should satiate the demand uh, for reserves from banks. Now, so it should, the, 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 the reserve uh, supply, the, vertic the vertical blue line, should be adjusted so that uh, we are at the intersection of the, of the demand for reserves and the zero horizontal line, which is equivalent to saying that the spread on reserves, that is the gap between the money market rate and the interest rate on reserves, should be zero, okay? And that's something that we observe, okay, in principle. Now, uh, so what has that 
uh, inter uh, spread on reserves being in practice, and um, all my uh, discussion will focus on the, on the uh, euro area case. So look at the red line. Jo please ignore the, the, the blue lines at this point. Just uh, That's the spread. That's the, the, the spread between the, the money market rate and the interest rate on reserves. And you can see that since uh, 2015, it has been negative. So that means that from the point of view of, this, of, the, of the previous graph, we are to the right of what would be uh, the, optimal, uh, the optimal point, okay? Now, Annette uh, goes beyond that, uh, that. In other words, there is an oversupply. There has been an oversupply of reserves. Annette goes beyond that, and she estimates the demand function for reserves. And that allows her to quantify what is the uh, um, reserve gap, the excess supply of, of, of reserves. And uh, in you know, some of the numbers that she gets, uh, I reproduce here, the optimal uh, uh, amount of reserves is, would be 1.7 uh, trillion as of today, and, and that's uh, much less than uh, the actual amount of reserves, which is 4 trillion. So the prescription would be the ECB should lower reserves through reduced funding to banks. Now, is the previous framework the one that is relevant for the ECB these days? I would say no, because since 2015, the margin that the, the ECB has used in order to in, increase uh, uh, reserves and increase liquidity has been uh, not through uh, injections of loans to, to, to banks, but through the purchases of securities. And some of those securities may have a convenience value uh, themselves. When the, when the ECB purchased those securities, it is withdrawing them from the, from the private market, okay? So it's reducing the convenience value of private in, uh, that private inv investors have access to, or the amount of convenient assets that private investors have access to. So the ECB or any central bank should take that into account. So um, we, we can think of a convenience value for treasuries, say government bonds, or whatever assets a uh, central bank uh, buys, and of course associated with that convenience value, there is a demand for those convenient treasuries. Okay, so investors will hold those treasuries up to the point where the marginal convenience value of those treasuries exactly compensates the interest rate differential between an inconvenient uh, asset, uh, say a corporate bond, and the convenient, uh, uh, say, go uh, highly liquid government bond. Okay, so that's the gap between RL and RT. Okay, so in that context, what is, is the optimal policy? Well, the, 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 the central bank has to take into account that when it injects reserves that are highly desirable, which is highly desirable, it increases uh, the convenience value uh, uh, that accrues to, to, to banks, it is actually removing uh, convenient assets from the private market. The optimal policy, and again, I, I will use the previous diagram to, to, to uh, to, to represent it, is such that uh, the optimal policy, the central bank should provide reserves up to the point, okay, where um, the marginal convenience value of private investors from holding treasuries equals the marginal convenient value of banks net of holding costs from holding uh, reserves. And that is uh, given by uh, the point at which uh, you know, this intersection between the reserve supply and reserves demand at which the spread on reserves equals the spread on treasuries. Okay, so it's the point that is represented in, in this diagram. Now, again, let's look at the, at, the, at the data for the euro area. Now, the blue lines represent different measures of the, of the spreads on treasuries and that we see that since 2015, they are well above the spread on reserves. Okay, so we conclude from the, from the perspective of Annette's framework, we conclude that um, uh, the ECB should lower reserves that would bring uh, uh, money market rates uh, up through sales of government bonds that would bring, increase the yields on government uh, bonds up to the point where we equate uh, the two spreads, or which is equivalent to equating the marginal convenience value of private investors and central banks. Now, of course, we can ask ourselves, well, why is the ECB policy on reserves has so far uh, from optimal, okay? And I think the answer is clear. Uh, in recent years, the uh, reserve policy and the, and, and the policy of buying uh, uh, assets uh, through 
uh, no, the uh, um, asset market program has not been driven by the desire to maximize the convenience value to society, but it has been driven by other considerations like stimulating aggregate demand and uh, uh, in increasing inflation when, when, when uh, that variable was, was below um, the target. Okay, so now let me just quickly go over some implications for ECB policy. Okay, so first is again related to what I just said, optimal versus uh, actual policy. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, um, use this uh, picture from a paper by uh, uh, Philip and, and Frank um, that shows the different uh, uh, po uh, um, interest rates that the ECB sets together with the uh, short-term money market rate, the Ionia in this case. So uh, up to 2015, okay, the ECB uh, was injecting liquidity through uh, by funding uh, uh, banks, not through loans to banks. Now, an edge framework implies that in that, con in, in that environment, the optimal reserve policy should have been such that the money market rate should have been equal to the interest rate on reserves, that is the deposit facility rate. But we don't observe that. Systematically, the money market rate was above the deposit facility rate, suggesting that the ECB was undersupplying uh, reserves. Now, this is true up, up to the beginning of the financial crisis in which uh, between you know, roughly 2008 and 2015, we see that that optimality condition is actually satisfied. But then starting in 2015, uh, the ECB starts injecting liquidity through purchases of uh, bonds, okay? In that case, the, optimal, the optimality condition for supplying reserves should be one in which the spread between the money market rate and the interest rate on, on reserves should be positive. Instead, it's been zero or a slightly negative as we, as we have seen uh, before. So in the more recent period, the ECB seems to have um, oversupplied reserves, okay? Now, another, uh, and as I said, the reason for this deviation in the latter period may have to do with uh, the fact that obviously the motives for expanding the balance sheet were different from maximizing convenience value. Now, what is not so clear is why there was the deviation from optimal behavior in the early period. Now, I understand there is a debate, second point, um, a, a debate uh, within the ECB regarding uh, how to implement uh, monetary policy when the interest rates are already positive and there's this discussion about the corridor of our system. And I think an edge framework can shed some light on, desirability, on the desirability of the two. So this is what I understand as the floor system using an edge framework. The floor system is one in which the central bank, you know, floods uh, um, uh, um, banks, the banking system with reserves up to the point where the interest rate, the market interest rate does not respond to, 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 to changes in the quantity of reserves. So that would correspond to this flat part uh, of, of the demand uh, for reserves. Now, we've seen that this is not optimal under I, um, either of the two scenarios that we have considered earlier. This implies an oversupply of reserves in an ETS, uh, an ETS framework. The corridor system is one in which the, the central bank you know, chooses uh, a stance for monetary policy and uh, an interest rate on reserves and then adjusts the, 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 the supply of uh, reserves so that is consistent uh, with uh, those. Now, um, in that case, what's the main drawback? So this could be in principle consistent with, uh, with uh, an, an the, the optimal condition for, uh, of the of, uh, reserve policy if the central bank uh, supplies liquidity through the purchases of assets, okay? Because the, the, the spread on reserves would be positive and it would be, could be such, okay, that it, it equates the spread on treasuries. Now, the drawback from this is that if the, demand, uh, if the re demand for reserve shifts around, uh, that may generate uh, a, a lot of volatility on market interest rates. Okay? So an alternative is what is known as a demand-driven floor system, which I think is uh, uh, something that could describe uh, well what the Bank of England does, which is you, know, you set uh, the interest rate on reserves at, what, at your desired market rate. And then you supply reserves perfectly elastically uh, in order to meet the demand for reserves at this point. 
I mean, this could be adjusted, and so this would be optimal in the case of uh, in, in, when the central bank, um, you know, purchases uh, um, inconvenient in assets, but it, this could be adjusted so that uh, the, the spread um, on reserves, that is between the money market rate and the interest rate on reserves, is positive in a way consistent with the optimality condition uh, when the central bank uh, purchases uh, securities. Now, a quick comment on optimal portfolio management uh, um, implied by Annette's framework. Now, a distinctive feature of uh, bond holdings by the ECB is heter heterogeneity, heterogeneity in risk, heterogeneity and other types of heterogeneity, liquidity and so on. So for a given total value of the ECB's portfolio, what should be the allocation across different assets, say assets issued by different juri jurisdictions? So this paper has a, a very clean implication, okay? Uh, the, uh, the ECB should equalize the convenience yields across issuers and maturities. That is, for any given maturity, it should equalize risk-adjusted yields. That is, it should sell the bonds with the lowest uh, uh, risk-adjusted uh, yields. Now, notice that this is very different from closing spreads, okay? Because the equalization is not an equalization of the raw yields, but of the risk-adjusted uh, yields. Now, of course, um, uh, uh, this uh, may run against political and legal constraints, but you know, this, these constraints can be changed, and, and I think Annette's framework provides uh, a useful framework to think about ways in which these constraints should be, and about reasons, reasons why these constraints uh, may be changed. Then another question is how to implement uh, QT. I mean, w the starting point, as we have seen in the euro area, is uh, the, that the ECB has a portfolio with, um, uh, with ja assets that have different convenient yields, okay? And in particular, the spread on treasuries is higher than the spread on, on reserves. So Annette's framework implies that the, the ECB should keep lowering reserves by selling the bonds that at any point have the highest convenient, uh, com convenience yields up to the point where the two, um, the two spreads are um, equalized. And the implication of this is that for any given maturity, uh, the ECB should sell the bonds with the lowest risk-adjusted yields. Now, whether the bonds with the lowest risk-adjusted yields correspond to the bonds with the lowest yields, I don't know. I haven't made that calculation, okay? But it's, the, it's important. It's, the distinction is very important, okay? Again, there may be a political and legal constraints that may prevent the ECB from doing so, but uh, as I said, Annette's uh, framework provides a way of thinking of, um, of uh, provides a, a rational for um, maybe uh, relaxing so those constraints. And finally, um, and the, the, pap the framework uh, of this paper assumes that the total supply of treasury, treasuries is taken as given by the central bank. Okay, that's uh, B in Annette's uh, notation. But, you know, obviously in the real world, that uh, supply is not an exogenous variable, the fiscal authority has something to say about that supply. And the fiscal authority may in internalize the impact that its supply of safe assets uh, will have on investors' convenience and hence on the interest rate that they, will be, um, that they will pay for them or the price that they will be willing to pay for those assets, okay? So there is a recent paper by Choi, Kir, Palani, and, and Perit that um, looks at the optimal um, uh, supply of assets from uh, the point of view of the, of, the, of, the, of the fiscal authority, and they show that if treasuries are all partly held by, by foreigners, treasuries with a convenience value are partly held by foreigners, um, it may be optimal to undersupply those assets in order to uh, keep uh, its yield, uh, their, uh, their yield um, uh, low. I think it would be interesting, maybe in an extension of this paper, to consider the interaction between the fiscal authority and the monetary authority and to see to what extent, to what extent the, um, your optimal prescriptions for a, a central bank may completely offset this uh, market uh, undersupply of assets by the fiscal authority. Just to conclude, because I'm uh, out of time, I think this is a very nice paper, highly policy relevant, very, very timely. It focuses on just one factor, which is the optimal supply of convenient assets. Now, this, uh, dimension or this, this factor may be overshadowed by other considerations, but I think it should not uh, be ignored at all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jordi. You have equalized the time that you have exceeded of your uh, time. So, you know, in that respect, uh, it's a drop.
I don't know, before uh, opening the, the, the floor for questions and remembering that uh, if you are connected via WebEx, you can raise your, your virtual hand if you, are, if you want to ask a question. Uh, I would give the floor to Annette. I don't know whether you, know, you want to, to comment something I, on the I comments. Spent, hmm? I took more of my time initially. Let me just emphasize that the, I'm not arguing that the ECB has done anything suboptimal in the sense that at different points in time, additional considerations were also relevant. The paper is above the, per the period where the fraud rate is above the effective lower bound, and what should the ECB do in this context, uh, you know, which is of course different from when the ECB did QE to stimulate the economy. But uh, thank you very much for an excellent discussion, and uh, let me open up the floor. Well, thank you very much. And now I, th I think that uh, Pierre Olivier, you want, uh, and Andrew afterwards, and there are another, another question. Pierre Olivier. Thank you, Pierre-Olivier Gouinchat from the, uh, the IMF. Uh, I thought this is a, a very stimulating paper, really, uh, really fantastic, so uh, uh, congratulations. Uh, one uh, question and one comment. Uh, on the, uh, the, the paper is a sort of Friedman rule flavor. There is, some, uh, there is some utility of holding certain types of assets and the central planner would want to sort of supply until you saturate uh, the, and, and, and uh, bring the marginal benefit to zero. And, but that's true, and I think that's a point that Jordi made in his final comment. That's true both for reserves, but it's true for uh, government assets. And so if I were to sort of uh, take your paper and say, now I want to think about the optimal supply of government securities, I would also want to conclude by the same logic that you'd want to issue whatever it's German bonds or it's uh, uh, you know, US treasuries up to the point where the marginal convenience yield of those assets is also equal to zero, and then the central bank could issue reserves up to the point where there is no spread between the two, and then we live in a happy world where all the spreads have been eliminated. Now, obviously, it's not that, but it's, it's a useful long-run guide. So I, I, want to, I want to push you a little bit and ask, well, do you think that the prescriptions you have for central banks also apply when you think about government uh, issuance of, of assets? The, the second comment is, You've, you've been using as a measure of the convenience yield, I, I, was, uh, I was struck by this, the, the spread between KFW and Bunds. And of course, in principle, one could think that KFWs and uh, you know, Supras, or whether you, this is also true whether you'd use um, ESM bonds or, or European Union bonds, there is a spread there. It's kind of surprising there is a spread there. There are, there are supranationals, there are guaranteed, et cetera. So that sort of brings the question of what is driving really this, uh, these convenience yields and if they can move in, in ways that are sort of, uh, you know, not really controlled, that, that sort of shifts the demand. And, and again, so do we want to sort of have a system where we would have the supply adjusting to that, to those changes in the demand? I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you very much, Peter Olivier. Andrew, I have a lot of questions and we do not have much time. Please be concise and to the point. Thanks, well, I think that's relatively easy because my question is a sort of slight development of Pierre Olivier and Jordi's last point. So, so central banks provide reserves for two reasons. One is monetary policy and the other is financial stability. And I can see that if monetary policy was the only reason, then, then providing reserves against liquid assets would be optimal. Um, but for financial stability reasons, the, yeah, there can be an optimal case to provide reserves against illiquid assets. And we're all trying to optimize the two things and work out, as, as you were saying, Annette, what the, in a sense, what the optimal uh, post-QE stock of reserves will be. So the question for me is, I think, how you develop the, develop the framework to say, how do you, how do you essentially uh, derive the optimum where it's a, it's a combination of monetary policy and financial stability reasons? Thank you very much, Andrew. I think that you have the next question. And I have three more questions. I have Ricardo, Janis, and Rita. Mm? And I think that I will close, uh, you know, because otherwise uh, we are going to exceed the uh, available time. Please go uh, ahead. Volker Wieland, Goethe University, Frankfurt. For, thank you for the thought-provoking paper and discussion. Uh, quick question. Um, one, it seems the main driver of asset purchases was really crisis fighting. First, the crisis fighting of the deflate or disinflation, deflation risk following the Euro debt crisis, and then the brief period of the Corona crisis. And we got to a stage of between 25% of public uh, debt to close to 50% of public debt being held by the EC ECB, on the ECB balance sheet, you know, depending on which country you take, 25 for Italy. So it seems there is a big, if you are in a crisis, there's really a big increase uh, you might want to implement. 
Um, and so that concern that having enough room, having reduced the balance sheet enough so that in the future one can do that again uh, should also be one, I think, factored in. And actually, it also matters outside of the uh, zero lower bound because um, the TPI is a new instrument precisely with the same objective to buy these assets with positive interest rates. So, um, you know, if you in two crises go to between 25 and 50 percent of public debt, that would argue for really reducing it maybe much more uh, that public debt holdings uh, than what the framework you presented implied. And also it might have the opposite sequence as of what Jordi said, because if it's about crisis fighting, you want to, you know, in good times, lower the holdings of those sovereigns who are more likely to get into crisis. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Annette. Uh, we have three questions. Yeah, let me apply first to Pierre's question. So, in the paper, I argue that one should equalize the convenience yield on everything. That's the optimal thing to do. That's not the same thing as supplying more government bonds to set convenience yields all to zero, uh, given that taxation is likely distortionary, right? In order to keep the, there's a reason we go through these endless debt ceiling dramas in the US, right? It's so we can keep the debt safe and liquid. So, so uh, I think your prescription uh, is correct only if taxation is not distortionary, which it is in practice. Um, in terms of the KfV bond spreads, I think they probably understate the convenience yield on bonds precisely because on bonds be precisely because of those government guarantees. They may pick up mostly the liquidity component, whereas the safety component is not in there. So, if anything, my results would be stronger accounting for that. Uh, in terms of the contrast between monetary policy and financial stability, I don't think they point in different directions in the sense that I suggest supplying reserves with it, quote unquote inconvenient assets when possible, which could be lending to banks, which is the same as you would do in a crisis, uh, under standard central banking principles. And I think in terms of also the headroom argument, you know, these are all valid points that, remember I had the suggestion that you say, okay, start with my numbers and adjust up and down depending on the weight you put on other factors. I haven't quantified how to do that, but conceptually, you know, if you're very concerned about headroom, you could want to go lower. If you're more concerned about interest rate volatility, you would want to go higher than the numbers that I described. Thank you very much, Annette. Uh, we have three more questions. I have Ricardo, Yanis, uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Greece, and Vito Constantio, and we close. So please, to the point, because Absolutely, we are two questions time. to the point. Uh, first, while you mention other factors, those factors sometimes are very correlated with the facts that you emphasize, and so I'd like you to expand on how they correlate. One, in my, when I asked the same question as in your paper in Jackson Hole in 2016, I focused instead on the central bank losses and profits, and the key determinant there was the maturity of the treasuries that the central bank buys. If it buys very short, it can have a much larger balance sheet. If it buys very long, it will have a much larger one, because as work by Seth Carpenter and myself many years later had shown, this leads to a more more volatility in those central bank losses, and as the last experience to confirm. How do convenience yields vary across short-term treasury and long-term treasuries? Because that will interact very strongly with this other motive for the size of the balance sheet. Second question, then a year later, challenged by Pierre Gorincha, uh, at the IMF annual conference, I wrote a paper on what's the optimal size of the balance sheet if we have different bonds with different default risks in a monetary union. And there the key consideration, very much along the lines of what Andrew just said, was financial stability and on how the size of the balance sheet depends on whether you can absorb more or less of that default risk, which then affects banks' ability to lend and the risk they can take. There, likewise, you said control for deposits is very important. From financial stability, either for the liquidity reasons Andrew said or the risk reasons in my IMF annual conference paper, it will be loans and the total amount of loans. How do I distinguish deposits and loans given their clear correlation and given that the size and risk of those loans is going to determine also the optimal size of the balance sheet? Thank you very, very much, Ricardo. Yarnes Estunadas. Thank you. Um, this is actually a very useful and nice paper. Um, I have the following question. Given uh, the fact that the architecture of the Eurozone is far from perfect, uh, one of the objectives we have in the ECB is to avoid fragmentation. So my question is, if, if we follow the rule that um, you propose, wh what will be the, the implications for um, fragmentation in the Euro area? Or uh, can I ask it in a, in a different way? Uh, do you assume a perfect capital market um, for your result? Thank you very much, uh, Giannis. And finally, Vito Constantia. I think that uh, is the question. 
Thank you. Um, well, you uh, chose uh, to uh, determine the size of uh, uh, reserves and then the balance sheet, the criteria of maximization of the uh, net convenience value of uh, supply of uh, reserves. It's a very particular objective and perhaps not the only one because it's not directly related to monetary policy because uh, indeed you said at the beginning that uh, above the ELB, the size of the balance sheet doesn't matter. Uh, I don't agree with this uh, uh, statement, initial statement. Another criteria to discuss the uh, size of reserves and the balance sheet uh, is and should be related also to monetary policy. Uh, uh, because the topical discussion that is ongoing about the size of reserves and the size of the balance sheet has to do with the choice between implementing monetary policy with a corridor system or a floor system. Uh, and the, the approach uh, you take uh, in the case that the supply of reserves is backed by purchases of uh, uh, sovereign bonds also with convenient yields uh, leads to a very uh, small uh, balance sheet to operate the floor system. And I see there a great difficulty. And the floor system is important because both the ECB and the Fed have been operating, uh, the ECB approximately, uh, a floor system since 2008 because we had fixed rate full allotment in October 2008 and then we had the LTROs and that created a situation of excess reserves and the uh, uh, money market rate approach very much already since 2008, the uh, DFR, the deposit facility rate. And then of course after 2015, it uh, uh, really uh, was uh, practically there uh, since then. But, and, and the floor system has worked well and has two big advantages to the uh, operation of monetary policy. One is the, it's easier and more certain to choose and determine the policy rate. Uh, if it would be through auctions and the corridor system, the ECB would have to organize uh, now uh, auctions of uh, almost two trillion, which would be messy and very difficult to achieve the desired money market rate. And the volatility that you already uh, mentioned could very well be the consequence of that approach. So with the floor system, you have uh, uh, the fixation, uh, the determination of the policy rate, and you have other advantage, that you have a second instrument of monetary policy because uh, you have the determination of the policy rate and you have the size of the balance sheet being separated both from that determination of the balance sheet. And if uh, ever, uh, for possible reasons, you need some QE, then you can do it and keep the desired money market rate that you want. So it has these two big advantages, the floor system, and uh, uh, this is related to monetary policy implementation, and it's not covered by your objective function of uh, uh, maximizing uh, just the uh, net convenience value uh, of reserves. Uh, how do you think these considerations impinge on the discussion about the desired size, uh, size of balance sheet, and if your approach can be made compatible uh, with uh, the uh, managing of a floor system. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Vito. Annette, and uh, I will give the floor you know, also to, to Jordi. So, That's Annette, uh, you to to I'm so brief. Let me just do it in order. So, Ricardo, I have investigated the maturity structure, the term structure of the convenience shield using a different approach. There is not much in the US down to the about three, the three year points where I have data. Bills have lower convenience yields. So the prescription following your thinking would suggest that the Fed might benefit from going a bit shorter in maturity than just holding the representative treasury out there. Um, in terms of the, the fragmentation, <coughs> I think that's a different issue, <coughs> sorry, than what I bring up here. My convenience yield can't go negative. Um, a fragmentation is a fundamentally different issue and the paper really does not speak to that. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, Constantius' question, uh, I disagree that central banking is not about providing payment systems. I mean, bank, you know, central banks, they 
he historically printed money for good reason. You know, many of them have it directly as a mandate that they're supposed to facilitate payment systems. So, so I view the whole supplying, say, for liquid assets as a natural extension of something that central banks also are supposed to do. And we'll need to have a longer discussion since we're already running over time about the very good question that you asked subsequently. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, I think that this is a very important contribution. Uh, I will read twice your paper before deciding on QE the next time. <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, well, uh, it's a partial equilibrium analysis, so I think that uh, we need to have other kinds of, uh, of, uh, of factors and to take them into consideration when we decide, uh, you know, about the evolution of our balance. So thank you very much. Th this brings uh, to, to an end, uh, you know, this panel. Thank you very much and uh, well done.